<laughs> I've always been a, b a big believer of having a full-time job and yeah. then having side hustles on the side. So I moved to Canada by myself at 17. So I, was, I lived in Dubai and my parents at the time had their businesses and I just didn't like the culture and uh, what was going on in Dubai in terms of like fairness and equality, mm -hmm. right? So basically I started at 21. Just to give you a little bit of perspective, Mike right now controls about $12 million in real estate. Throughout his investing career at different points, he's probably touched 200 units. But don't hold back. Just do things, you know? I mean, that's my biggest, like, energy and getting stuff done is, like, my two biggest, like, strengths. Like, are you a doer or a donter? Yeah. Because the donters just keep watching and learning and learning and learning. But, hey, man, you're learning. Like, you're a lifetime student. That's great. Mm -hmm. But you got to actually do something with your lifetime information, yeah. right? You be a doer, not a donter. Yeah, don't be a donter. What is up, YouTube? In today's video, I sit down with my buddy, Mike Van Hout. He's absolutely crushing it in the real estate game. We hit a lot of big numbers, actually, in this video as well. He's touched over 200 units. I think he's got $12 million in real estate right now. He recently just retired from his full-time day job to kind of focus on his entrepreneur uh, hustles as well as his real estate empire. Lots of great advice in today's video. And we also break down how Mike got from where he is today from where he started. It's a great story. Mike's a huge personality. I know you guys are going to love this video, so let's dive into it. What is up, YouTube? Matt McKeever here with Mike Van Hout. I'm really excited for today's video. We're going to be diving into his entire background and experience with real estate investing. Just to give you a little bit of perspective, Mike right now controls about $12 million in real estate, mainly here in southwestern Ontario. Throughout his investing career at different points, he's probably touched 200 units. And and I can remember probably back in like 2016 is when I first met you. At that time, I was just blown away by how many different projects and businesses you had on the go. So you definitely strike me as that serial entrepreneur type. <laughs> yeah, I, I, uh, well thanks Matt for having me on your channel. That's awesome. It's been probably two and a half, almost three years trying to get on here, but I wanted to come here with some ammunition, some firepower. Um, <clears throat> so in my mind, um, I've always been a big believer of having a full-time job and yeah. then having side hustles on the side. Um, one of the main causes to that was energy. I just get really bored really fast and I just like to do a lot of things. So I've always focused on having a full-time job, growing and be the best person you can in that job, and then taking the T4s, because the government needs a T4s, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and taking those T4s and then buying property. So basically I started at 21. So I started at, at Audi, so I sold cars. So I've been selling cars for 17 years, which I recently just left, so like chattering. Um, but yeah, so I was selling cars for that long and basically my first year in selling cars, uh, I made just under 100K. And the car business at the time was fairly lucrative. There wasn't a, there wasn't a ton of players in it, um, and I worked with Audi, so it was a brand that wasn't really at its peak like it mm -hmm. is today. So it was kind of growing. So you could there were some there were some margins there. Um, so that first year, uh, a buddy of mine who was from London bought some property, uh, and he bought sort of a, a, a I think it was like a five or six house bedroom, and he paid eighty thousand dollars. And I was like, just like you, blown away. And like, how can anybody buy a house this big for $80,000? Um, so I started looking and I thought, you know what, what better investment to park your money because the stock market was just not so good. And I didn't want anybody else to control my money. So I'm yeah. a bit of a control freak. So I thought, what am I going to do to get in the real estate space? So I came down to London back in 21, or when I was 22 years, 21, 22 years old, um, to see what it was like. So I, I saw this big, huge building on Quebec Street. And, uh, and it was like, yeah, that's great, but it was just like so boring. So I was like, well, how can I make it interesting? So at the time I was single and I'm like, and we drove, we drove by Western and I was like, man, there are so many girls here. <laughs> and I'm like, how can I get in the real estate space? We'll have girls. And, and I was like, student rentals. So single, obviously I'm happily married now, family and all that. But back then I was like, how can I get, look at all these girls, it's amazing. <laughs> So I bought student rentals. So I bought, I started targeting six and seven bedroom homes. Um, and at the line at the time, they're yeah. all in the $200,000 $200, area. Um, so I bought a whole ton and I filled them with girls. So for me at that point, it wasn't really about, oh, I'm gonna get into real estate because of money and the numbers and how great they are. It was more like, hey, you already heard it, girls. 
Um, so my wife's gonna shoot me now. But anyway, so at that, that was my mindset at the time. And uh, yeah, so and, and I was in Toronto and I just filled them up. I got a property management company to run it at the time. Pretty straightforward. And uh, yeah, so I was like the cool one with my buddies and I've always been in the try to be cool game. So super douchebaggy at the time for sure, talking about it now. But at the time it made sense and I was like, hey, it pays the bills. I'm writing down the mortgages. Cause everybody I talked to at the time was just saying, well, property is a bad game. You know, don't get in, 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 the, the, in, like in, in real estate, you know, the markets go down and some of the old dogs. The problem is that nobody young was buying real estate yeah. at the time. It was everybody older and everybody older believed that real estate wasn't the best investment. They believed in other investments like businesses and just different strategies they had. So at the time, I, I didn't really know what to do except for like this strategy, like just to be cool, you know yeah. what I mean? So, and I worked obviously for the car business. I had, I had a, you know, I was, I was living with my parents at the time and I wanted to have my own condo, but instead of investing money in a condo, I bought these, these rental properties. Um, which paid down the mortgage, and at the time the rates were like four and a half, five percent. So I saw a two hundred thousand dollar house cost at the time about twelve hundred dollars a month in yep. mortgages, right? At four and a half percent, and I'd be getting between sixteen hundred bucks and two thousand bucks a month in rent. So that got me seven hundred dollars a month in rent, seven hundred dollars in equity or in uh, in like yeah. cash flow, yeah. in cash flow. Um, sorry, I haven't talked about cash flow in, in years. <laughs> I don't like to get that stuff anymore. But yeah, so I got that. And then I had time seven at the time. So it was like five grand. I'm like, oh. And then my buddies would all joke around. I'd be like, yeah, man, I got made five grand a month taking care of like 50 different girls. You know what I mean? <laughs> Even though I didn't really do the work. But it was kind of cool just the, that yeah. narrative, right? So and I've always been a big car guy. Um, those who know me on the internet, cars are my thing. I just love cars. And you know, growing up, my dad used to send me. Um, my, we lived in Dubai at the time. So growing up in Dubai, Getting access to, to foreign goods wasn't easy. It's not like it is today. Back then, Dubai was sort of just slowly growing, and I'd always get auto trader, oh, sorry, car and driver, and uh, and just different magazines of yeah. car stuff, right? So I know everything about cars, and cars are my thing. And I really, really realized that guys love cars. You know, girls can care. They don't. They don't care. They sit in a hundred thousand dollar car or forty five thousand dollar car. They don't know any different. But guys really, really like cars. So it was like at the time, being young, it was like cars and girls. So that's why I got in the car business, and then I got in the rental business. Um, but as time went on, um, I realized that dealing with student rentals are, are, are just not easy. They're, they, dig, they take too much work. Um, you're too, there's too much pressure to rent it from like May to May. People don't want to do it. And, and I had college rentals, so Fanshawe, mm -hmm. and I had university rentals as Western. Um, and what I found was that Fanshawe at the time were really the landlords that own these spaces were giving away they were really giving them away. They were doing yeah. eight month rentals and they were sticking to eight month rentals. So for the next four months, what are you doing? Whereas university would stick to one year. They'd do 12 months and they'd be pretty consistent, but it was a May to May thing. Um, and then what I saw is that, yeah, you rented in May, by the time they move in and have fun, university starts really for them in September, you know, mm -hmm. September, October, by the time they really get in the crank of it. And then in December or November, you're showing the places again to the next round. Yeah. Well, these ones get pissed off at these ones because they're coming through their space. And then these ones are not happy because these ones don't take care of it. So now you're getting crappier tenants the next time around. And then it just kind of go, it just keeps funneling around. And by the time you get your places back, they're just destroyed. And the numbers don't really make sense when you have destroyed places all the time. So then I pivoted um, in my in my mid twenties. I sort of pivoted to dumping the student rentals because I got into more you know fruitful relationships. <clears throat> fruitful relationships. Um, I'm thinking of Matt Pichet and fruitful yeah, investor, yeah. right? Um, but yeah, more fruitful in, uh, relationships. And I started realizing, well, the student rental thing is not for me. I did rent, rent to some guys at some point, and they'd they throw mad parties. And I had, uh, I guess, one of my followers will see that. He used to run the Western Ski, Ski and Snowboard Federation, and they built a massive half pipe oh, shit. in the backyard. This was like all over the news at the time, and it was like on all the underground boards and stuff like that. It was a huge, huge, it was like two and a half stories. This thing was probably like oh, wow. a good 40 feet high in the backyard, and it ramped down, and they had all, on, they had like GoPros at the time. GoPro was big, yeah. I think it was like 2006, 2007 area. Uh, sorry, 2008 area, and uh, yeah, GoPro's big, and they'd have like all kinds. If you go on YouTube now, you can still see guys jumping off this half ramp in my backyard. Interesting. These are big pig rolls, and just basically a one big party, you know. So that was cool. Like, I mean, you have a, your landlord, you own it. It was cool. Now the other side of it, like the, all the conservative guys are thinking, are you out of your mind? You're gonna let these people do this stuff in your house? But it was cool. I didn't care. I wasn't really thinking about the money. And I think that's one thing that I've realized that if you're not focused on the money, and we have conversations about this yeah. all the time, um, is that too many people focus on the money. And I mean, yeah, I get it. The numbers and the analytics all make sense. But the money, along with overthinking, just stops decisions. 
And if you're just gonna make that decision, if, if you can't make a decision because you're overthinking it or you're only focused on the money, then nothing really gets done. Mm -hmm. You know, and in my opinion, I just think that that's been my drive is like, just yeah. get it done. Um, I can't remember the movie, but I, this, the guy made the funniest statement, and I'll never forget this. He's like, there's only two types of people in the world. There's doers and there's donters. And it's like, don't be a donter. And it's true, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, you just gotta do things in life. And I mean, like, obviously not do things that, like, sacrifice your personal well-being and, and your lifestyle, um, but don't hold back, just do things, you know? I mean, that's my biggest, like, energy, and getting stuff done is, like, my two biggest, like, strengths, yeah. you know, in, in my, and in, like, how many people on, on your side that watch your show, um, and I see, I read your comments, and people are like, well, what do you think I should do this? What do you think I should do that? And I feel like if you ask all these questions, it's great, but they slowly die from getting things done because you're really mm -hmm. looking for, for reaffirmation and just looking for things to kind of, excuses basically. Yeah, way too many people are looking for permission to go out and get started. And so I'd love to dive into how, like, so 21, a lot of people are telling you real estate's not necessarily the best investment, yeah. but you decide to do it anyways. What gave you the confidence to do that? Cashflow Tribe. Hey YouTube, have you checked out Cashflow Tribe yet? It doesn't matter whether you're an experienced, seasoned investor or brand new to the game. I, I can probably predict if you're currently not having the level of success you want as a real estate investor, it's due to one thing. That one thing is, you're not making enough offers. Plain and simple. You need to be making more offers as a real estate investor if you wanna hit those big, audacious goals that you're setting for yourself. So here's the deal. Cashflow Tribe, that's that's the community that myself and Ben were making together. And so Ben's actually so busy trying to provide value to you guys that he had to take off there. But here's the deal. Cashflow Tribe is really a one-of-a-kind community focused on results. Results. That's the difference between us and everyone else. We want to get you guys those results. I'm tired of seeing people commenting on my YouTube channel for two, three years now, but they're not making offers. What's holding you back? I, I'm gonna guess that it's either a lack of confidence or a lack of competence. And we cover both of those things in Cashflow Tribe. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna make you guys a seven day free trial offer. You can join Cashflow Tribe completely free, get it tested out. If you like it, great, stay and pay. If you don't, well I hope you at least find one great idea that you can take away and use to start making more offers, gain more deals, and finally start making the money related to real estate investing that that's probably why you're watching my YouTube channel. So let's do this, guys. Let's make 2020 your year. Cash flow, try it. Yeah, I mean, I think it it's it has to do with upbringing as well, right? Like, I mean, I've I come from a I come from well in Dubai, you just see you see the ultra poor that build these skyscrapers for pennies, and you see the ultra rich that you know that drive around Ferraris with eagles on their door and and you know and and basically these ultra lavish lifestyles. So you realize like, you know, there's the ultra poor and there's the ultra rich, and that creates that sense of like you know. I want to have to work, and I want to. I want to see that I have the opportunity I've been given, right? So, so at 21, so I moved to Canada by myself at 17. So I was I lived in Dubai, and my parents at the time had their businesses, and I just didn't like the culture and what was going on in Dubai in terms of like fairness and equality, mm -hmm. right? So I decided at that point, I said I just don't want to be here anymore. I want to go and I want to just live my own life, and I want to get my driver's license. So this comes back to the car again. So I want to get my driver's license, and in Dubai you have to be 21, all the way to 24, depending on who you knew and how you did it. So. Mm -hmm. I got it. So when I, I realized that we got immigration to Canada and Australia, so Canada to get a, you get a G1 at 16, right? Yeah. 15 and three quarters of 16. Um, so I didn't actually get because you had to graduate licensing, and by the time you got your license, it'd be one year. So I got my M1. So M1 and M2, you can just do, it's a writing exam, right? And you, you do this little this little course, and very easy to get it. So I moved to Canada at 17, lived lived with a buddy of mine, and and a whole bunch of like stragglers as I got kicked out in different spaces, but. <laughs> Um, but I got my license and I was the only dummy driving to high school in a, on a motorcycle. I used to have a Kawasaki EX500, so, or EX, yeah, EX500 at the time. Gutless little motorbike in the winter, up Sarnia Road by people pushing me because I'd get stuck in oh, my motorcycle. Yeah. I was the only dummy driving motorcycle. So at that, realized, I realized that if you just did something different, people would actually notice you mm -hmm. and you could make an impact to other people that thought, hey man, if this dummy can do it, I can do it. You know what I mean? So that's how I got into these, these things and, and that's, that took, gave me the confidence um, and actually having a half decent job and realizing that you know, I've got these, this money and the government has this, this program where if you put money in RSPs, you can pull the money out and use it as your down payment, right? So 
So sometimes in life you make you make those decisions out of your own thought process, but sometimes it, you kind of just walk into them. Like I had this eighteen thousand dollars that was sitting in my bank because at the time it was eighteen thousand dollars you could put in RSPs. So after one year, I had eighteen thousand dollars and I didn't want to put it in the markets. I wanted to do something with it, and you can pull the money out, buy your first house, and go down that route. And that's exactly what I did. So I bought more and more, not on that platform, but that's that gave me the push yeah. to do it, you know. And then I thought, oh man, this is cool. I'm gonna tie tie that in with being cool, and I got my first spot and. It's just crazy, like thinking about it now that there's not too many things that I would do to just be cool, right? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's like, like again, it's like douchebag stuff, you know? Yeah. But at the time when you're 21, you just do it because you don't care. And you're so naive and arrogant in your 20s. So all my 20 year olds looking out there, yeah. like if you're arrogant and you're naive, just do it. But don't hurt anybody, but just do it. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? And don't overthink. And, and I think as we get older, so now, just sort of fast forward that and we can go back in a minute yeah. but now i'm 37 and you know i've got i'm at the point now where i just left uh, audi i've been with audi for 17 years i just left audi and for me to get from leaving audi to figuring out what my future life is um, i don't want to ever forget to take risks and chances mm -hmm. by not by thinking like by overthinking you know because you get comfortable in, in the space yeah. that you're in and the skin that you're in and the lifestyle you're in and and how much money that comes in every month where you're you're comfortable right you know and com being comfortable is dangerous. Yes, it really is. Yeah. Like golden handcuffs, you know, a lot of people refer to their day job as like yeah. you get addicted to that T4, that active income from payroll. Yes. And it can be really scary to leave that. And one thing we touched upon briefly before we started filming was also you like a lot of people when you've been at the same employer for 17 years, yeah. a big part of your personal identity becomes yeah. that as well. Yeah. So it's not even just the golden handcuffs. Sure. It's also like the, am I willing to let this part of my identity go or leave it behind? For sure. And I mean, in, in saying that, I think people that know me or if I had to, if I died today and I had to write my script backwards, I would say like, what am I known for? And the things that I'm known for is multiple things. And I just like multiple streams of income, multiple hustles. I mean, there's all kinds of funny ways to say it. Yeah. Um, but I've always believed if you have five things and if one goes down, you still have four more. Or if you have two goes down, one goes more. Um, and from a mental, like a spiritually standpoint, you think that um, if you're stressed in one, so like, mm -hmm. you know, we're, you know, we get into business together, it's, it's a stressful position. I have four other businesses or four other things that I can focus on that takes the stress away from this, right? So you, ha so that's why I, I never really worried about the money or I, I try to live as like low stress as I can because you can't be happy, optimistic if you have stress. Yeah. That's, Absolutely. that's the truth, right? So you just try to be happy, optimistic and, and give back to others because, um, I don't know how you know your viewers um, situations are and I don't know where everybody is in their life but you know and they always say like if you give back you give back you get more and it's true and mm -hmm. sometimes people don't give back because they think that there's uh, you know there's some sort of like secrecy to keeping their information you know um, and I was part of that a little bit growing up I felt like I'll just keep this this information yeah. until I realized there's enough rentals for everybody mm -hmm. everybody can buy real estate there's no stopping anybody from buying real estate whether it's a good buy or a bad buy that's not up to me Mm -hmm. But as long as I tell you the information or I give you the guidelines or the path, just like you have for all those years, all these years and the information you give to your, your viewers, you know, you tell people like, this is how you have to do it, this is how you have to do it. But then you still have people asking questions, like very basic questions because they don't yeah. take the time to look at it, right? You know? So you can give people all the ideas, all the, all the information that you want in the world, but what they do with it is not necessarily what you think they do with it. You can tell somebody like, man, please don't buy this or... Um, or in my twenties, like one of my one of my things that I that I like have strength in is like conversation with relationships. So for me, relationships with like women. So I've had a lot of girlfriends, like friends that are girls growing up. And one of the things that if they'd have issues with their boyfriends, I'd, or, or you know, relations are going to get into, I'd be like, look, like you, you see the signs, you know, he's going to be this way. But some people just have to go mm -hmm. through it, you know. And it's the same way in in any space. Some people just have to go through it. Even you can tell people all day long, like, man, I don't know what you're going to do. Like this is a bad idea. But if they listen to you. Or if they didn't listen to you, that would structure their, you know, their their viewpoint. But people just have to do it, go through the experience and get over it, you know. But they have to do it. That is the most important. You have to get off your whip it ass and do it, you know. So. I love it, yeah. So I guess before we wrap up this video, yeah. any recommendations or suggestions on how to get over that analysis paralysis or that fear of taking action? Because there's, I know there's people watching my YouTube channel right now that have been watching for three plus years yeah. and they still haven't submitted a single offer to buy a rental property. 
Yeah, I think, I mean, I think they have to be comfortable in their own space first, in their own skin, right? So I think that's the first step. I think people, um, that'll get, when they buy something, they'll give them the confidence to buy something else. Yeah. But, but I think being, being safe in your own skin is the first thing. So I think that um, just doing it, you know? So whether it be doing small tasks a day, well, just, just being, um, I feel that a lot of, in today's world, I mean, like, you look at it in the sports world, there's, like, people say, like, basketball has become soft, right? You know what mm-hmm. I mean? And people have become soft. I think that people just are so scared yeah. and, and so timid in just trying to get information, and they feel like the more information they get, they get the stronger they feel. But really, are you an absorber or, or like, are you a doer or a donter? Yeah. Because the donters just keep watching and learning and learning and learning. But, hey, man, you're learning. Like, you're a lifetime student. That's great. Mm-hmm. But you've got to actually do something with your lifetime information, yeah. right? You know? Um, so I think, that, and that's why I think sometimes when I go back to being 21 and being crazy and girls and doing this nonsense, then it's being naive yeah. and not even thinking about it, right? Just doing it, being naive because sometimes and like analysis paralysis, you get this information and you can't do anything with it, you know? Mm-hmm. So yeah, I think just do it, uh, get the information that you feel like you need to make, make the, pull the trigger. But at the end of the day, the trigger is on me, on you, yeah. right? You know what I mean? You can't blame somebody or if it goes right or wrong, you just got to do it. As long as you're not giving up, as long as you have, you have a roof over your head, you got food, um, that's all you need, man. You know, I mean, there's, there's so much out there. There's so much opportunity out there. Mm-hmm. And there's so many people that are not taking the opportunity because I had this conversation with my wife yesterday and uh, there's, a, there's a girl that passed away. She's 37. And what she did was she went to, to poor countries and she saw, like, if anybody, if I'm not sure where your viewers are, if they range as far as India or Africa. So if you go to poor places that are just, that they're just, you know, socially, just, they're just not built well, we don't have the infrastructure as we do in Canada for, you know, for welfare, disability, mm-hmm. healthcare, and that kind of stuff. Um, so those countries, there, there's this girl that passed away yesterday, or sorry, three years ago. Uh, I had a conversation with my wife where this girl, she went and she created 50,000 jobs uh, by just taking, taking, the poorest of the poor and basically getting them to a certain level where they can actually afford their own environment, you know, to like basically sustainable income. It doesn't have to be millions, but it just mm-hmm. has to get them from poverty and just one step up. So she basically started basically taking these entrepreneurs and putting them together in a model. Um, and now like an, an example would be, um, I'm not sure exactly sure where in, in Africa, but she basically took pine nuts and she converted them and all this stuff. And, uh, and then they, she created like a model and then now she sells in the U.S. and she takes the proceeds and, and you know, and pays oh, okay. it back, right? You know what I mean? Um, she's basically giving back, right? So she got to a point in her life where she made enough money and she had a roof over her head and she, she did that. Uh, but then you come to Canada and I mean, we're all basically, I wouldn't say spoiled, but, but, yeah. but we're all like... It's a Over, very good gig. It's a very good gig. And that really takes, that puts major complacency in place. Mm-hmm. That really pulls back on, on hustle and grind. And, and if we do anything, like, so I'm like, okay, you know what? I just did this today. So, but you know what? Hold on. Let me put my phone out and tell everybody. I'm like, man, you know what? Yeah. I moved a couch today. Like, <laughs> good for you, man. You know, but that's, that's as, as where we've become. You know, that's what we, and we don't think about the hard struggle in this life. So growing up in a, in an, in a, in a, in a great space, cause Dubai, you think about Dubai, you think about riches and crazy, but there are poor people yeah. in Dubai and you got to think about if you come from that and there's lots of immigrants wa- that watch your show and lots of mm-hmm. people that want to, you know, and even in Canada, there's tons of, there's tons of poverty here. You just don't yep. see it, you know? Um, and a lot of those people probably watch your channel because the ones that are, that are up here probably just don't, don't, they don't, they feel like they're closed. They don't need to get any for inf- for information, mm-hmm. you know? So I think the people that want to strive to become something will have the drive, but just don't caught up, get caught up in or analyzing everything. I think that's the key, you know? Yeah. So. I love it. Be a doer, not a donter. Yeah, don't be a donter. Um, don't. That's the next choice. Yeah. Be a doer, not a donter. <laughs> don't be a donter. <laughs> so if people want to follow along with you on your journey or gain contact, what's yeah. the best way? Um, so I'm at, it's a very difficult question because I'm at that phase where I just left my job and I'm trying to figure out the next strategy for me. And I think it's part of this, this whole concept of getting on here and, and, and doing five different things with your life. So if one goes down, you got four more, but uh, on my personal, on my personal Instagram, be awesome. Um, it's at Mike Van Hout. So I guess we'll tag it we'll somewhere here. The description down yeah, below. somewhere around there. But, uh, yeah, any questions hit myself up or Matt and be happy to help. Awesome. Thanks, Mike. You're welcome. Thanks again to Mike for taking the time to really sit down and break down his entire journey as a real estate investor. If you guys love this video, and I suspect you did, smash that like button. Hit the subscribe button if you're new to my channel. If you guys want more great YouTube content related to Canadian real estate, click this playlist right here or check out this video right here. And until next time, remember, making money is a team sport. There's more than enough money in this world for us to all make it, but if you're not saving it, I mean, like, what's the point?